and then uh, uh, we have um, Karen Parker, who's um, actually the counsel for the Japanese Latin American internees and our families since uh, the early 1990s. And she's been representing the Japanese Peruvian internees in the US courts and also filed um, a petition on behalf of the former Japanese Peruvian internees um, in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Because what we did was we went through the US court system and we couldn't find justice here. So we had to go to an international arena. And so she was our champion there. And really what we're trying to do is hold the United States government for the failure, the ongoing failure, to provide redress for war crimes and crimes against humanities. Because that's the level of the violations that were perpetrated against our families. And we're actually waiting a decision. Hopefully it'll come out next year. But besides representing us, she's also an expert and advocate for World War II war, war rape victims, often known as comfort women. And uh, she has also petitions pending before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, uh, currently on the, um, in terms of the Iraq war, uh, the US attacks on hospitals and medical facilities in Iraq, which are protected under the Geneva Convention. So let's start with uh, Karen. Thank you, Grace. And it's really um, very, very nice to see so many come out on a nice, warm, hot day, actually, in Los Angeles and give up some of your time to listen to this presentation and to hopefully learn a little and hopefully get a little more involved. I found out about the Latin American internee program of the United States in 1981 when I interned as a law student at the Organization of American States Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which now has our lawsuit. It was at the time when the <clears throat> Civil Liberties Act was starting to be uh, talked about. And at that time in the OAS, I was asked to look into the forced internment and movement of people based on ethnicity as an issue because there were other cases arising in the Latin American community at that time. Uh, I was so shocked to find out about the Latin Americans. I was raised with parents who educated me every day about some of the um, issues that were important to them and included in those was the need for Latin American redress excuse me, the, for Japanese American redress. When I found about, out about the Latin American redress, I, didn't, I asked around and I didn't find a single person who had ever heard about it, other than some of the offices in Congress whose document box I was allowed to look through contained the information. One of the most striking things for me at that time about this situation, besides the fact that it was essentially unknown, was the fact that a commandant in one of the camps subsequently became one of the leading human rights attorneys and professors in the United States, looked up to by many, many law students for years. I was a law student at the time. And this law professor has never acknowledged or apologized for his role in World War II, just to let you know how things are there. You've heard a lot of discussion uh, already about the kinds of laws that were violated when the United States went for Japanese-looking people in Latin America. It went searching for people they could arrest, kidnap, take as hostages to exchange for Americans of European ethnicity with Japan in prisoner exchanges. Uh, I just want to let that sit in a minute. The United States did not feel, although they could put Japanese Americans in camps without raising the hackles of the United States non-Japanese ethnicity people, but felt that if they actually then exchanged Japanese American citizens for, um, for uh, European American citizens, that there might be a bit of a hue and cry. So they created this program, which they kept as hidden as possible. Under then existing law, which was before the Geneva Conventions of 1949, obviously, 
and before we had human rights law. There's still a concept in law and had been for several hundred years called customary international law or a kind of universally accepted standards of behavior um, between countries and what countries could do to their own people. We know what it was at the time because subsequent to World War II, we had Nuremberg tribunals in which the legal scholars and the states got together and decided what acts that took place in World War II would be actionable in the tribunals. Obviously, what happened to the Japanese Latin Americans fit that criteria, and that criteria is war crimes and crimes against humanity. The United States, however, was not on the block at that time for its own actions in World War II. When we began redress, we went eagerly into US federal courts thinking, well, yes, of course, when we point out that Japanese of Latin American ancestors, ancestry were excluded from a bill to redress what happened in internment programs in the United States, um, that of course a court would find, well, isn't that discrimination based on national origin? Or, but when you read the Civil Liberties Act, it doesn't specifically say anywhere that it excludes Japanese of Latin American ancestry. Um, I actually was shocked to read the kinds of opinions that came down in which the only criteria that judges would find for excluding was an off the record, uh, well, it was actually on the record, but it was a comment made by one of the backers of the bill saying that the bill was not intended to redress what Peru did. Well, I said, well, we're not suing on behalf of what Peru did. We're suing on behalf of what the United States did. So that comment on the floor had no bearing on the case whatsoever. Unfortunately, that comment on the floor subsequently used to support regulations which excluded Latin Americans of Japanese ancestry um, prevailed in the legal actions. When we failed with the Art Shibayama case and his brother's case, in the district court. We went, as we were told we had to do, to the Court of Federal Claims. There we didn't have much more luck, except the judge in that case said that the Japanese Latin Americans could not be considered illegal aliens when they were brought into the country by the United States with American guns at their back. So we did win a legal victory, which I hope will be taken to heart by groups involved in similar situations today. We also won from the judge a rather stirring apology, which is in some ways as important as the money. An apology heartfelt and real and that recognizes the gravity of the offenses is one of the most essential elements in what the international community refers to as full restitution and remedy for human rights and humanitarian law violations. <clears throat>